morning to one and all. This webinar is brought to you by Mumbai Hematology Group. It is supported by Natco Oncology and managed by Mice Ideas. I thank Mr. James Rajakumar and Mr. Srivastava and their team from Natco, Rajesh Kalpesh and their team from Mice Ideas, Executive Committee of Mumbai Hematology Group, our chief guest for the day, Brigadian Dr. Satyaranjan Das from Pune, our guest speakers, Dr. Revati Raj and Dr. Ramya Upaluri, all our discussions who are themselves eminent hematologists, pediatric hematologists, medical oncologists, or bone marrow transplanter, new participants for sparing your Sunday morning. To introduce you to the next weekend activities, Saturday, 14th August, 7 p.m., to Dr. Julie Cantor from University of Alabama, Birmingham, US speaking to us on sickle cell disease and her subject is sudden death in sickle cell disease. Next day, Sunday, 11.30 a.m. to Dr. Marco Capecci from Milano, Italy, going to speak to us on recent advances in management of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Our guest speakers today are Dr. Revati Raj and Dr. Ramya Upulari. Dr. Revati Raj is MBBS, DCH, Lab, MRCP, MRC Path, hematologist, pediatrician, bone marrow transplanter at Apollo Specialty Cancer Hospital, Chennai, and Apollo Children's Hospital, Chennai. Dr. Ramya Upalari is pediatric hemato oncologist and bone marrow transplanter at Apollo Cancer Center, Chennai. They're going to speak to us on hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in inherited bone marrow failure syndromes, a case-based learning. Discussions today include Dr. Pranta Chakrabarti, who is a hematologist, Fortis Hospital, Nightingale Hospital, Vivekanand Institute of Medical Sciences, Apex Institute of Medical Sciences, Calcutta. Colonel Dr. Rajan Kapoor, who is Professor, Department of Medicine, Consultant Hematologist, Command Hospital, Eastern Command, Calcutta. Dr. Sunil Bhatt is Director and Clinical Lead, Pediatric Hematology Oncology and Bone Marrow Transplanter at Narayana Health Network Hospitals, SRCC Children's Hospital, Mumbai, and Majumdar Shah Cancer Center, Narayan Health City, Bangalore. Dr. Shweta Bansal, Senior Consultant, Pediatric Hemato Oncologist and Bone Marrow Transplanter at LTMG Hospital, San Mumbai, and Sir HN Reliance Foundation Hospital Research Center, Mumbai. Dr. Ruchira Misra, Senior Consultant, Pediatric Hemato Oncologist, Bone Marrow Transplanter at SRCC Children's Hospital, Mumbai, managed by Narayana Health. Dr. Pranuti Kini, Consultant, Pediatric Hemato Oncologist at MCGM Comprehensive Thalassemia Care, PHO and BMT Center, Borimdi, Mumbai. And Dr. Amit Jain, Consultant, Pediatric Hemato Oncologist and Transplanter at MCGM Comprehensive Thalassemia Care. PHO and BMT Center, Borivli, Mumbai. So those were the discussions for the day. We now come to the Sunday quiz. Today's quiz is related to a rare hematological disorder of which until this year, only 1,500 cases have been published worldwide. We will give you eight clues show you one clinical picture and eight and seven radiological plates. Whatever diagnosis you make, you have to mail it to mbagarwal1 at gmail.com. The winner will be fastest finger first, that is the first correct diagnosis will be the winner of the day. So you've got the email ID at the top. Whenever you can make a diagnosis, you can mail your answer to that. The first to tell you about the eight statements regarding this rare disease. It was first described in 1930. The vast majority are adults with a mean age of 50 years. There's a male predominance of 70%. It's a multi-system Disorder affecting almost all organs of the body. The most common organ involved are long bones, heart, 
CNS, lungs, retroperitoneal tissue, and skin. It has features of systemic inflammation testified by raised CRP in over 80% of patients. Histology shows fibroinflammatory infiltrate. 10 years ago in 2012, a molecular event was discovered in this disease and that has helped in progressing its treatment. So that's the only clinical picture we are going to show you. Now you will have seven radiological pictures. So this is plain x-ray of the knee joint, femur and tibia. That's plain x-ray of the ankle joint. That's a plain x-ray chest. That's a scan for the lungs. Another scan for the lung. This one is a scan of the abdomen. And that's an MRI of the brain. Okay. So whatever diagnosis you make, you can email it to nbagarwal1 at gmail.com. And now to introduce our chief guest for the day. That's none other than Brigadian Dr. Satyaranjan Das. He needs no introduction. All of us know him. And if you have anything to do with hematology, oncology, bone marrow transplantation, you know him for last four decades. At present, he is professor and head, pediatric and clinical hematology at Command Hospital and AFMC Pune. I request him to inaugurate our today's webinar and also give us words of wisdom, especially for our fellows and trainees. Over to him. Good morning, everybody. Thanks uh, to uh, Dr. M. B. Agrawal, sir. At the outset, I want to thank Dr. M. B. Agrawal, sir, and Mumbai Hematology Group for giving me this opportunity. Few words to say that Dr. M. B. Agrawal has been the flag bearer of hematology in this country. We all agree to that. Single-handedly, he has been running educational programs for student, from our student days. I, in fact, if I tell you, I got interested in hematology when I was serving as a pediatrician in INHS Hassuni in Mumbai, attending his uh, CMEs in Mo Bombay Hospital. When we became hematologists, common people were hardly knowing that this is a subspecialty or super specialty. But today, people know that this is an important super specialty because of his endeavors. He has been conducting CMEs and teaching doctors at various levels for so many decades and educating them on hematology. That's why we do have some recognition today in hematology. And I just, I think uh, Dr. Evati reminded me, I want to congratulate the country and everybody here that this country has won a gold medal in field and track. So whether Neeraj Chopra has made this country proud by winning a gold in javelin. Now coming to the subject, the subject that is hematopoietic stem cell transplant in inherited bone marrow failure syndrome is very close to my heart. Being a pediatrician, we have been seeing such patients from the time we started our MD pediatrics. I just remember about a very dear patient of mine. She was an army officer's daughter and the officer was running pillar to post for a diagnosis. And those days, stress cytogenetics was being done in very few centers. And again, it was not very reliable. Some center will give positive, some will give negative. So we diagnosed 
the child as Fanconi's anemia and had a sibling who was HLA match and we transplanted. Unfortunately, after a year, she rejected the graft. Again, we searched for conditioning and somewhat we did a second transplant from the same donor. 15 years, she lived a very good quality of life. Unfortunately, she succumbed to CA oesophagus at the age of 28 years. That was a bad luck. It may not have, same bad luck may not happen to every inherited bone marrow failure syndrome. We have a lot of uh, Fanconi's, even uh, uh, this keratos, uh, she has also been transplanted and living a good quality of life. So on the subject today, two doyans in the subject will be speaking, that is Dr. Evati Raj and Dr. Ramya. So I will not go into that at all because my role was to just say something about hematology and this country. Again, I want to thank Dr. M.B. Agrawal for keeping the flag of hematology high in our country because of his efforts. Not only that we doctors have learned many things or we have been continuously getting educated on hematology, but lacks of patients of hematology, those who have been earlier been told that you have got incurable disease and this treatment is not possible in a country. Today, every corner of this country has got a hematologist and these patients are getting their appropriate treatment and getting benefited. Sir, it is all to your efforts. Few of our uh, teachers, those who have made hematology in this country, a subject to recognize. With that, I inaugurate this webinar and thank again everybody, those who are attending. Jai Hind. Thank you, Brigadier Satyarajan Das, for those very kind words. It's a very inspiring speech, and I'm sure that the trainees and the fellows will benefit from each word of your speech, which was worth gold. We will now go to the main subject of the day, and we have the lecture by Dr. Revati Raj and Dr. Ramya Upulari. Over to you. So thank you, sir, for the kind invitation, and uh, Dr. Satya for uh, the really kind introduction. Um, it is our pleasure, uh, Ramya and I, to be here today. And uh, he asked, what subject would you uh, talk about? And uh, just as uh, uh, Dr. Satya had said, we also have certain uh, uh, patients that are very dear to us. And then we say that we have to talk about this. We have to think about it. So we chose HSCT for uh, inherited marrow failure syndromes and uh, it is actually one of the most challenging things. So we have 45 minutes in which we have to share our lifetime's experience. So it's a lot and we try to do um, as much as possible within this uh, short time. And thank you again, Dr. Agarwal for this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And I'm really happy to have Ramya with me. And the way we are going to do things is um, when we transplant someone, for any transplant, we need a patient, we need a donor, we need them to be conditioned, we need to collect stem cells from the donor, we need to provide them supportive care, we have to follow them up immediately and long term. So everything is a seven step journey. So um, today's theme is all our lucky seven. Uh, with harmony with nature. So we go, we're going to talk about cases in each of these individual seven sections and we hope at the end of it you will have some idea of what we're talking about uh, with the uh, lucky seven. So the bone marrow uh, failure syndromes have given us a lot of insight into hematopoiesis. What are stem cells? How do they work? What are red cells? What are white cells? How are platelets produced? So uh, they have opened a really big world on uh, what happens when hematopoiesis gets impaired and also unsuspectingly into the whole world of cancer because there's so much that we learned about the world of cancer from uh, uh, working up these patients with inherited marrow failure syndrome. And this is only the tip of the iceberg that we know. And we know that this is increasing rapidly our knowledge, but still there's a lot to learn. And the seven hallmark disorders of marrow failure syndromes are Fanconi anemia, dyskeratosis congenita, Pearson syndrome, which present with all cell line failures, but diamond black fun, which come with red cell, 
initially, Schwarman diamond, which come with white cell initially, con congenital neutropenia uh, with white cell problem initially, and congenital A megakaryocytic thrombocytopenia, which start off with a platelet problem. And eventually, all of them lead either to aplastic anemia or MDS AML. So the starting story is different, but the end, all uh, roads lead to uh, Rome. So Fanconi is a DNA repair defect. All our DNA has to uh, uh, be repaired and the whole block of uh, repair mechanism is at fault. So all the tissues of the body are affected, but the hematopoietic is maximally affected. And uh, a lot of research has, to, has gone into why uh, our blood is most sensitive. And uh, 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 this has again, uh, uh, has made us understand how normal hematopoiesis works. And basically, as uh, my uh, friend, Dr. Sheila Mohan puts it, it's a fast forward disorder. Everything's happening. You go from newborn to old age very fast inside the cell in Fanconi anemia. And they can present with the hallmark uh, short stature, skin changes, and uh, looking with the somatic features, or they can have a Fanconi mosaic, which a completely normal looking child, which can only be confirmed on skin fibroblasts. And FARF is an organization you can all look up. They've provided beautiful treatment guidelines for us on how to manage these patients with Fanconi anemia with specific focus on malignancies and what we can do for surveillance and treatment. Dyskeratosis congenita is the next uh, uh, set of disorders where we now have ways to assess telomere length. So telomere length, as we grow older, the telomere gets shortened and telomere length tells us how young we are, how old we are. So uh, these are mutations in uh, where the cells age very rapidly. And DKC has again taught us that the lungs and the liver and the hematopoiesis are all linked because some of them in their family can present with liver problems and some with lung problems. And they have five to seven times uh, risk of cancer, all of these patients. Pearsons hardly survive the first birthday and they have pancreatic insufficiency with mitochondrial disorder. Diamond Black Fun, where again, beautiful work has been done on the zebra fish to say why mid facial anomalies and hematopoiesis are connected. So a lot of normal physiology has been learned from reading about ribosomes. So we've talked about DNA repair genes, we've talked about uh, uh, telomeres, we've talked about uh, mitochondria and ribosomes. So a lot of basic physiology. Again, Schwarman diamond, uh, pancreatic insufficiency with uh, 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 RNA processing defect. Severe congenital neutropenia, again, a huge spectrum. Some uh, neutrophil elastase gene mutations, they can only present with chronic gingivitis in adult life, whereas some in the newborn period present dramatically as uh, neutropenic children with invasive infection. Congenital A megakaryocytic thrombocytopenia with the MPL gene mutation has taught us a lot about thrombopoietin receptors. And because of this condition, we now have so many targeted therapy for other disorders like ITP and aplastic anemia. And eventually all of them uh, become aplastic. So these can present as classic presentation with their uh, head and neck malignancy, birth defects, aplastic anemia or AML over family history with the cytopenia and syndromes or non-classical marrow failure. So this is the new and interesting part of this field. There are new disorders which we hadn't even heard of in so many years. So ADA2 defi uh, defect where they present with auto-inflammatory immune deficiency. So there's a, an overlap between PID now and uh, 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 inherited aplastic anemia. And these are children who have presented to neurologists with cerebral vasculitis or with the, to the ophthalmologist with recurrent optic neuritis. And then we find that they have uh, start off with red cell aplasia and then go on to pancytopenia. Again, SAMD9 defect with multiple infections and then they uh, progress on to pancytopenia and we'll be talking a little bit more about these non-classical presentation. 
So we move on to the first group of uh, our seven uh, sisters. So first is about patient selection. So uh, I will hand over to Ramya to talk about the two cases that tell us how important and teach us the principles of patient selection in these disorders. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, first off, I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Agar Agarwal, sir, for the opportunity. And of course, my mentor, Dr. Revati Raj, for taking me along this ride uh, today. And uh, Dr. Satyaranjan Das said, Doyans, I'm certainly not a Doyan, sir, ma'am is certainly very much experienced and you know up there as far as pediatric transplant is concerned i'm very much a student and i'm really honored and happy to be a part of this discussion because a lot of the people in the discussions also are my teachers like dr sunil and dr shweta bansal and uh, dr rajan and uh, dr chira and olifera and my colleagues as well so uh, looking forward to that discussion also but like ma'am said we'll move on to just uh, to illustrate cases and then a little more discussion on each of these seven steps that ma'am was talking about. So the these cases will uh, basically highlight that the world of IBMFS today is not restricted to just the Fanconi and the DKC as is known till now. And there's a huge spectrum of disorders now more and more coming into, into this um, uh, um, sort of the category of IBMFS. So this and all these are real cases who presented to us. So this is an eight year old boy who presented with pancytopenia at the age of six years of age. He was evaluated just for some routine fever and his HP was 6.7, total counts were 1,900, 10% neutrophils, platelets about 15,000. Totally in the last two years till he came to us, he required about PRBC and platelets twice and not very significant bleeding. The bone marrow was done, of course, as expected outside. This showed absent megakaryocytes specifically. So like an amegakaryocytic thrombocytopenia and stress cytogenetics were negative. Next slide, please. So this was, uh, there was clearly a deformity on his forearm, which could be visible, although functionality was absolutely normal, for which um, uh, the x-ray was done and showed this, uh, which is radio ul ulnar synostosis. He also had dysplastic right thumb, dysmorphic ears, and retrognathia. Next slide, please. So because of the pancytopenia and clearly not fitting into Fanconi based on not just the clinical features, but also the um, uh, stress cytogenetics, uh, whole exome sequencing through NGS was performed, which came out to be MECOM mutation. So these are newer uh, um, uh, sort of MECOM associated syndromes, which are being diagnosed in the non-Fanconi, non-DKC group of IBMFS, one of which is the present child. The second case, again, Eight-year-old boy uh, was evaluated for fibrillinus, very short history of about six months prior to transplant. Again, found to have pancytopenia. He had significant uh, anemia and uh, thrombocytopenia for which he required much more platelets and PRBC and was quite transfusion dependent. And bone marrow showed hypocellular marrow with cellularity less than 25%. So this boy, again, not fitting, um, I'm sorry, I didn't put in the slide, but stress cytogenetics again done here was negative. So whole exome sequencing done which came out to be something even rarer of which uh, only about six or seven cases have been reported the worldwide, which is ERCC6L2 homozygous mutation. So both of these were IBMFS and both of these children have subsequently undergone a transplant. So uh, uh, thanks, Ramya. So the, um, um, one second. When we see a new child with aplastic anemia, what are the workup we need to do? Obviously, all of us will do a stress cytogenetics, but it's always do, uh, important to do uh, uh, other tests to see uh, if there's pancreas uh, uh, function is okay. How are their lungs? How is the kidney, liver? Sometimes it can be a simple clue. They'll just have a horseshoe kidney or an ASD. Then we know that this is more likely to be inherited rather than acquired aplastic anemia. And some of these have overlap with primary immune deficiency. So we may need to do primary immune deficiency, for example, their immunoglobulin levels to see if they need uh, to be supported until as a bridge to transplant. But NGS has now replaced a lot of the tests that we would do before. And I'm sure in the discussion, we're going to have questions for which children would you do NGS? And I think we've learned over the last five years is it takes about two weeks to work up a child to transplant. And we these days we can request for a fast turnover uh, NGS. And it's always better to have this information before we start transplant, especially. 
because a lot of our conditioning or how we prepare the child for the treatment depends on what the NGS shows. And if there's a family history of liver problem, lung problem or cancers, always think of inherited marrow failure. In South India, where consanguinity is high, when they come from small community, if the baby has presented, the child has presented less than two years, anyone who looks like a Fanconi, but uh, the stress cytogenetics is normal. So any somatic, it can be something very subtle, just two cafe au lait spots. Think inherited marrow failure syndrome, or if previously they've had IST and failed to respond. So these uh, come as packages, the uh, uh, NGS, and they are quite comprehensive and uh, economical for the amount of treatment they're going to ha have. So a transplant is not inexpensive. So I think the basic foundation is to have an N uh, NGS and the spectrum. Sometimes, as I said, this is a baby with a serenonos defect and they initially you think this is primary immune deficiency, but this spectrum is now all uh, like a Venn diagram meeting each other. So the primary immune deficiencies and uh, because some of these disorders don't affect just the stem cells, but they can have uh, a huge impact on the lymphocyte and lymphopoiesis. So initial presentation can come as recurrent infections rather than cytopenias. So the second aspect, so we've spoken about the special tests. We've spoken about the uh, uh, NGS. When to transplant? So if a child looks like Fanconi anemia and uh, the uh, diagnosis is Fanconi, but when will you plan their transplant? Now counts are normal. Child is only two years. So should we put them through transplant right now? This is a, a very important and difficult decision when counseling families. We had uh, uh, a physicians, uh, both parents were physicians and the child had diagnosed Fanconi anemia at the age of three. Every year they would come and say, maybe we'll think about it, think about it. And eventually at the age of 10, they had come with JMML and we transplanted her after she had evolved into JMML, which made the transplant far more challenging than when we could have done it earlier. Early transplant makes a difference if they are less than 10 years. This is results from Dr. Parinda Mehta's uh, group, which showed that if they are exposed less to uh, anabolic steroids, less transfusions, it makes a huge difference. And as a big bridge to transplant androgenic steroids, we all use stanozolol, danazol, which always help boost hematopoiesis. And now there is a lot of information coming up to say that uh, the cytokines are the ones that destroy hematopoietic stem cells. So if we use drugs like etanacept, which block cytokines, TNF alpha, um, uh, then you you could have uh, uh, you could delay the onset of marrow failure in these uh, children. Also, there is a huge impact on uh, uh, transfusions, and we have all seen those who've had less than 15 transfusion, those who've had multiple more than 15 transfusions, the outcomes are really different. So it's better to get them to transplant early rather than wait. This is the last pack, uh, aspect of uh, patient, um, uh, 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 patient selection that I want to spend a couple of minutes more. Have a look at this. Um, there is in all other conditions when we transplant, for example, primary immune deficiency, thalassemia major, if they've had their transplants and they're okay. Aplastic anemia acquired, they've had their transplant, they're okay. But in these inherited marrow failure syndromes, along with their primary defect, they also have cancer predisposition, other organ involvement. So their event-free survival is actually very, very poor compared to other children we transplant. So when we counsel on day one, pick up families who will come back to us regularly for follow-up. Emphasize only this group and the inherited metabolic disorders. When we transplant Hurler, Gaucher, these also need a long-term follow-up because their issues are going to continue or even get more as they hit teenage or young adulthood. And this is uh, the same for Fanconi, DKC, uh, diamond black fun, children with di diamond black fun, successful transplant now as a teenager osteosarcoma. So uh, we need to tell them that these are, this is a very, very important aspect that long-term follow-up, there are prescribed guidelines by EBMT and they have to come back. 
So I'll end with patient selection and go next to donor selection. I think uh, donors are equally important in this jigsaw puzzle. And I'll hand over to Ramya to talk to uh, us about the cases we've dealt with, with issues with donor selection. Thank you, ma'am. So um, um, as far as, you know, all of us know that, you know, we need to consider the safety of donors as well. And in IBMFS, of course, more than, of course, safety of donors is important, but also to know that the donors are fit for donation in the sense they are not, since it's, uh, most of it is an autosomal recessive uh, disorder and a lot of it phenotypically may not manifest upfront. A lot of donors may be carriers. Hence, the importance in this spe specific disorder or this group of conditions to uh, screen donors. So this is a five-year-old boy, one of twins. He was evaluated for recurrent febrile illnesses from in infancy. Uh, had neutropenia for a long time. Uh, PRBC transfusion at three months of age when HB was low. He had oily stools at 18 months of age, pneumonia at two years of age, culture positive E. coli, uh, UTI at three years of age. Uh, he was also subsequently evaluated and found to have uh, pancreatic insufficiency and he was on enzyme replacement. So I'm sure this conundrum of uh, uh, symptoms will tell us that this most likely is and it did turn out to be schwann diamond syndrome. He had a twin. Um, we uh, did screen the twin completely and uh, even the NGS was performed in the twin. He was not carrying the uh, mutation at all. And he was a fully matched twin. And hence, this child has subsequently undergone a matched sibling donor transplant. Next slide, please. So this is another, I mean, this is something that probably we'll see more often than not. So this is a three-year-old boy who came to us absolutely normal walking in. And this boy was actually evaluated as a donor for his sister who was already diagnosed to have Fanconi anemia. But this boy was not was not uh, uh, checked for Fanconi, but he was just evaluated as a donor. He was a matched uh, sibling and therefore pre-BMT workup was done at which time they found he was pancytopenic. And um, subsequent evaluation showed that this boy also was affected with Fanconi anemia. So therefore he obviously could not donate stem cells for the sister. The sister was, was quite far along the disease and she died. But this boy, as soon as they diagnosed, they came, we evaluated the dad, took up the dad, took up the child for a haplotransplant from the dad, and he's well touched with now five years post-transplant. Okay. And yeah, Nam, please. Thanks, Ramya. So uh, as she said, with the donor, sometimes we don't even know whether uh, uh, they are a carrier of the same condition or not. So this is uh, uh, pictures uh, shared with the permission of this family. Uh, the elder boy had diamond black fun and uh, uh, he obviously looked dysmorphic. This is his sister who had the, the same uh, gene mutation, but there are so much differences in the genotype, phenotype, not, no dysmorphism. He has learning difficulty, hearing difficulty, but somatic features, nothing. But she's also uh, got transfusion dependent uh, um, anemia. So it, the, uh, they can look normal, but as Ramya said, it's sometimes difficult to pick up that they have a similar illness. So definitely we need molecular workup before we take them up for a transplant. And as I said, some of them may not initially manifest any cytopenias, but they can evolve later. So it's really important to look at the donor uh, very, very thoroughly. And this is true of uh, uh, dyskeratosis congenita because uh, some members of the family can have only lung problem. Some members can have only liver problem. Some of them have only macrocytic anemia, but they all have shortened telomeres. And so they're not really uh, um, uh, optimal donors for the patient. So telomere length, if we, if we can get, or the uh, gene sequencing is important to confirm that they, they don't have the same disorder. So uh, uh, we spoke about uh, how the genotype phenotype can vary and how the donor can look completely normal and it's important to assess them correctly. So there are three uh, donor sources we can take, a matched family donor, a matched unrelated donor and uh, a haploidentical donor. And I just want to spend a few minutes on matched fa family donor. This has the best results in all of the inherited marrow failure syndrome somehow. Uh, say, for example, in leukemia, when we do transplants, the uh, more and more papers are coming out that haplodonors or unrelated donor of matched family donors, the outcomes are all meeting up and they are one and the same, but not so in, in, in inherited marrow failure syndrome. There is a very big gap 
when the uh, um, family donors outcomes are over 80%, the unrelated donor is not so good. So, uh, so many people, so Fanconi anemia, inherited marrow failures are the ones that are the first for everything. So these are parents that were desperate to help their uh, first child who's affected. So Savior siblings or PGD first came for a child affected with Fanconi anemia so that the outcomes would be good. Matched unrelated donor, initially the outcomes were not so good, but now there are so many advances that in Western countries, they are saying as much as 94% um, outcome. So uh, here we are not there yet, but good 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 results from western countries so what is the difference between matched sibling versus matched unrelated i would just put this case here to say we had two siblings that we transplanted the first one we did a sibling allograft with flu trio thiotipa and she did really well the second one we did a matched unrelated donor and this was a very tough transplant so same protocol we just added atg but she had a very stormy course and uh, had a lot of CMV infection and finally, and GVHD, and we finally lost. So haploidentical transplant for Fanconi, this is uh, data from our group, which uh, uh, Ramya had published. We have about 60% survival with post-transplant cyclophosphamide, but Western countries, the outcomes are much, much, much better. This right graph shows data from Dr. Carmen Bonfim's group from uh, Brazil, and they have similar outcomes. So uh, th there's a long way to go. We are not there at 94%, but hopefully we'll get there. So we've spoken about the patient, we've spoken about the donor, and the crux of the matter comes to how are we going to prepare them for the transplant. So I'll hand over uh, to Ramya to talk about cases uh, to do with conditioning chemotherapy. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, again, the teaching or the known thing in general is that when it is IBMFS, it's already a marrow failure and you'd want to not myelo, you don't probably need to myeloablate or you would probably lose the child with to transplant related mortality if you myeloablate too much. But um, the uh, uh, thing is now, especially with more and more disorders coming under the spectrum of IBMFS and more and more gene mutations as explained in the a patient selection sex section coming up, this uh, dictum doesn't hold true for all IBMFS. So for example, this child, a 10 year old boy, he came with recurrent gingivitis since infancy, recurrent febrile illnesses since infancy, including a brain abscess. He had persistent neutropenia, bone marrow aspiration showed myeloid maturation arrest and gene mutation uh, turned out to be Elaine mutation. So as you can see, this is a case of severe congenital neutropenia. Now, this condition, if you were to do, if one were to do a reduced intensity conditioning, the child is not going to engraft because there's a lot of immune dysregulation as well here. And the neutrophils are specifically affected, but the rest of the marrow is, is not as, my, as suppressed as you would expect in, in maybe Fanconi. So therefore, this child required um, a, a milo ablative conditioning or a reduced toxicity conditioning, as we might, we might put it, including thiotipa, triosulfan, fludarabine from a fully matched mother. Uh, and uh, tacrolimus in short course as methotrexate. Uh, he's been doing well, he's engrafted, he's almost two years post-transplant. Now this is um, like man puts it as one of our uh, difficult and if I can say disaster stories, but this is a 27 year old, uh, actually 27 year old male, but his presentation was since childhood on uh, with recurrent infections. Uh, he required IVIG, prophylactic antifungals. Um, he also, uh, uh, I might put in earlier itself, had uh, some amount of cytopenias in the beginning as well. Whole exome sequencing uh, showed, turned out to be serinos XLF deficiency, which is, a, which is a type of radiation sensitive severe combined immune deficiency associated with marrow failure. Next slide, please. So he then subsequently developed very severe aplastic anemia in 2016 and uh, multiply, multiply transfused. He transformed into AML, received flag chemotherapy, which he tolerated pretty well. And then he was uh, referred for a matched, fully matched sibling donor transplant. She was a multi uh, sister. And when he came itself, he had a lot of comorbidities. He had fusarium sepsis earlier also during a post-flag chemotherapy. Because he had received so much of chemotherapy and uh, uh, fusarium infection related antifungals, he had drug induced uh, interstitial nephritis. We did a PET CT, which still showed some amount of uh, fungal sepsis, 
bone marrow was however in remission he was treated with voriconazole for about 2 weeks and then taken up for a transplant next slide please so uh, he had obviously a dna repair defect which had immune deficiency and uh, aplastic anemia but he had one of the worst transplant um, related toxicity regimen related toxicities he had skin gut liver renal toxicity he had hypoxia radiation pneumonitis like changes and he died of multi organ dysfunction on day 28 post transplant so uh, this is uh, um, uh, this was one of our learning uh, experiences because we thought he had tolerated flu uh, flag chemotherapy and he had aml which for which he had received only one cycle chemo so we had to balance what do we do for the aml what do we do for the uh, aplastic anemia and the immune deficiency so uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, the reduced intensity conditioning with just fludarabine and uh, triosulfan was not something he could handle and the skin uh, lungs gut liver kidney all organs showed radiation tox uh, radiation like toxicity we didn't use radiotherapy but this was like somebody exposed to uh, whole body radiotherapy uh, uh, without support so uh, it was Uh, uh something that we uh probably in hindsight should have used a lower dose of conditioning like just fludarabine and cyclophosphamide and nothing more so uh, uh, uh again uh, uh, these are things that we are learning with time so reduced intensity conditioning is the backbone of all uh, marrow failure syndrome transplant and people are seeing if we can go lower and lower because conditioning chemotherapy has immediate side effects plus late effects these are the children that are prone to uh, um uh, cancers in the future so one of the main drugs that have formed the backbone of all the rick transplants is fludarabine and this is data from dr john wagner's group who showed that fludarabine makes a huge difference if we can do, do uh, drug dosage levels the outcomes are better and dr parinda mehta has also shown that targeted busulfan is uh, what uh, uh, helps with optimal outcomes some conditions however need myeloablative conditioning and if we use just flu and sci they are not going to engraft so should we go for a more immunosuppressive regimen or myelosuppressive regimen depends on what uh, 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 condition we are dealing with and some cases we do use fludarabine and melphalan and we'll come to that during the discussion so diamond black fan cosman and schwarman diamond do need myeloablative conditioning but they cannot tolerate uh, busulfan without uh, drug levels so since we don't have uh, optimal aucs for busulfan pharmacokinetics we have used the fludarabine thiotepa and triosulfan and all the children have done beautifully on this protocol so um, this is uh, uh, you have to pick and choose who need full conditioning the children that ramya had first presented uh, with the uh, uh, mecom they also need myeloablative conditioning so they are aplastic anemia but we are pouring in thiotepa fludarabine so uh, if you don't give full conditioning they reject the graft so uh, the other thing is radiotherapy these are all patients who have uh, dna repair defects so they are prone to cancers so should we give radiotherapy or not and that two gray radiotherapy is important for us to get the graft in and uh, rejection rates are, are high if we don't give so should we use radiation free regimen not in our country where a lot of people come with multi transfused fanconi anemia and if we don't use the two gray radiotherapy we'll have a higher rejection rate as seen in this uh, paper where the patients who didn't have radiotherapy had a higher uh, rejection rate zero therapy makes a difference atg definitely reduces graft rejection so more and more we are employing atg we are going back to atg which initially when fludarabine came we are using only fludarabine cyclophosphamide but now we know that if we combine fludarabine cyclophosphamide and atg then uh, outcomes are very optimal so we've moved from uh, 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 using reduced intensity conditioning to risk adapted conditioning and this is uh, uh, dr parinda mehta's group uh, which did the cooperative trial to say um, do they have 
what is their age what is their uh, background do they have mds do they have aml and based on each of these groups they had targeted busulfan and the outcomes were wonderful about 90% for all of the groups so uh, and the mds group aml group they also had azacitidine post transplant so from targeted regimen we have now uh, looking at radiation and alkylator free regimen dkc children are the worst because the outcomes long term as uh, dr satya had said late effects are very high so uh, can we get away without radiation without alkylators so there is a now uh, a trial in the us to use only fludarabine and campact anti cd52 antibody to see if that conditioning is enough to get the graft in so uh, we've spoken about patient selection donor selection uh, and how we have to condition then we now have to get stem cells from the donor so what are our choices uh, ramya will present the cases thank you ma'am so um, now this is a very interesting story which uh, dr revati has told us several times and all credit to her for getting this story in and making it a success so this was way back in april 20, 2007 i wasn't even into i was still just learning a lot just about the wow aspect of what hemonc is and way back in april 2007 this was a, i mean he was 6 year old at that point in time uh, from uganda and um, he uh, was diagnosed to have fancon anemia from uganda they had no facilities to do any treatment there the previous sibling had died of complications related to fancon anemia so the mother brought this boy and uh, just i think presented herself in front of dr ruti there was no family donor she said i'm not going to move you do what you whatever you can and get my child out of this so then the whole process of like they say necessity is the mother of invention and they i think dr ruti and all the other people with her just searched and searched and found an unrelated cord uh and did the first unrelated transplant of india way back in 2007 thanks to that mother who said that i believe in you and these are dr ruti's words this is what she's taught us and it's such an inspiring story i think she told her that i believe in you and you do what you can so uh, that's how it started so that's where the cord blood transplant started uh, so the point of the case presentation is is to stay, say that how it's over time it's changed from just a match sibling to bone marrow to pbsc to cord but today of course we are in a different age where haplo rules so again where did that start from so this this i was present very much present for this boy's um, uh, case where he presented to us when he was 4 year old and he was evaluated by several endocrinologists before that for short stage and this is the case and this is the story for several children with fanconi as we see they are very fine clinically but just because of short stature finally he was found to have pancytopenia and therefore diagnosed to have fancon anemia next slide please so this was in 2014 already haplo transplants were happening everywhere and even at our center but for fanconi uh, at our center we had not performed a haplo ptci as yet so again this boy didn't have a family donor or didn't have a match family donor no unrelated donor again necessity is the mother of invention so after counseling the family and re learning about the data on on ptci this child underwent a haplo uh, transplant with ptci uh, and he is now um, almost i think what 7 8 years post transplant and he is doing well okay thank you ramya i think yeah um, uh, the cord patient's mother taught us about faith and said that i'm just going to sit here and pray that god's going to guide you and make my child better and that put a lot of stress on us so uh, we'll talk about the different stem cell sources first one is bone marrow and this is uh, uh, work from uh, uh, um, uh, 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 all of the marrow failure syndromes to say uh, marrow is better than pbsc and the outcomes are better but pbsc is also got its own advantage because our patients come usually platelet refractory because they've had non leukodepleted non irradiated blood products so they all when they already come platelet refractory there is space in our country or they come with uh, opportunistic infection or uh, uh, fungal infection when they are pan cytopenic and pbsc has its place when you have to get the graft in rapidly so uh, this is again it's got its space to say although marrow is standard there are times where we would, we would, we would consider using pbsc 
So as I said, Fanconi had the first of many, and this is the first Fanconi cord transplant done by Dr. Gluckman. That is the uh, patient and his donor who's, uh, uh, um, uh, who was transplanted from umbilical cord blood stem cells. And uh, 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 when we do sibling cord who are fully matched, we always add marrow to prevent rejection, but this wasn't done in the case. It was a, a sibling cord and the child is doing so well uh, 30 years from this transplant. So unrelated cord, however, had a lot of rejection and the more mismatches, six by six did well, but when they were five by six or four by six, rejection rates were very high and complications were very high. And cord uh, was a good source for Fanconi, but it wasn't the answer. And uh, now we also realize that uh, we have to look at the CD3 count in the graft because the more number of T cells we give, the more chance of GVHT. And we have to remember that conditioning causes mucositis. GVHT damages the mucous membrane. And these are all going to be the bed for future cancer. So we have to design our transplant in such a way that they don't get much mucositis. They don't get graft versus host disease. So we try and look at CD3 counts in the graft and try and reduce the CD3 count. So we have always cut off CD34, capped off at 5 million uh, cells per kg and try not to give very high CD3 doses, more than two to three uh, into 10 plus seven so per kg of the recipe and body weight. So TCR alpha beta has been a complete game changer. If you speak to uh, Dr. Parinda Mehta, she says, GVHT, what is it? We don't see it because whether they are sibling match unrelated or haplo, everyone gets TCR alpha beta depletion. So there are no T cells in the graph, so they don't see GVHD, so their outcomes are better. And the incidence of GVHD is so low in all of their graphs. Obviously, it's an expensive procedure, so it's not something that we use in all of our patients. So this is all about stem cell source, and I'll hand over to Ramya about supportive care. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, uh, we'll uh, go straight into the case. So like we know, IBMFS, again, especially Fanconi's uh, DNA breakage repair, we can expect a lot of regimen-related toxicity. So again, more regimen-related toxicity, more GVHD, more uh, risk of cancers uh, in the future and more late effects. So therefore, supportive care makes a huge difference. So uh, this is a five-year-old boy, uh, Fanconi anemia, diagnosed at three years of age. He was multiply, multiply transfused. I think, I think almost about 40 or 50 transfusions before he came to us. Very high ferritin as expected uh, with 6,700 elevated liver enzymes as expected. He was also hepatitis C positive thanks to the multiple transfusions. Next slide, please. So he underwent a haploptci from his uh, 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 unaffected sister. And uh, uh, as expected, he had a lot of grade three, almost grade four mucositis. He had neutropenia. Neutropenia, uh, so therefore fever and uh, increased risk of sepsis, alloimmunization, platelet refractoriness, thanks to all the multiple transfusions. The concerns here, of course, hepatitis C. So prior to taking him up for transplant, even though he was transfusion dependent, he did receive about three months of uh, this combination of ledipasvir with sofosbuvir, and we documented hepatitis C to be negative before taking up for transplant. And uh, uh, NAC N acetylcysteine has uh, turned out to be, a, I think, a wonder drug here, where we've used N-acetylcysteine in this child for the first time uh, as an infusion along with the PT side. And uh, that we have, we have seen and we've uh, analyzed the data to say that it has helped in decreasing the rates of mucositis and elevated uh, SGPT. The second is, uh, again, this is a sad story, but an 11 year old girl, uh, uh, the previous child is doing well, by the way, he's almost like five years post transplant. The uh, second case, of course, is 11 year old girl, Fanconi anemia, again, diagnosed at six years. So for almost what, uh, I think six, five years or so, she's received stanozolol because she wasn't very transfusion dependent. So parents said, okay, we want to wait for transplant. And so they continued on stanozolol. Again, pre-BMT workup was done. Ultrasound showed features of peliosis hepatis, as you can see here. And she underwent a haploptci from her, uh, again, unaffected brother. She engrafted, she had 100% donor chimerism, but she then developed pain in the right hypochondrium around day plus 26. The CT abdomen showed dub subdiaphragmatic fluid collection. Even before any intervention could be done, she had sudden onset of abdom abdomen distension, tachycardia, hypotension, drop in HB, which was uh, um, suggestive of rupture of the peliosis hepatis. And she uh, very 
uh, quickly succumb to uh, the event that had happened. Next slide. These are not stories, as Ramya said, that we would hear from the West because they don't have multi-transfuse patients. They don't have patients who are on long-term anabolic steroids. So it is important for us to share, to say that why uh, early transplant is important in these uh, children. We believe strongly in N-acetylcysteine because... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, if I can interrupt. I'm so sorry. I think there was a, a typing error there. It's milligram per kg, just... So, um, um, for mucositis, we have uh, used N-acetylcysteine and uh, we uh, extend the mesna infusion also when they're on cyclophosphamide and this combination has helped reduce mucositis. DKC patients are prone to lung fibrosis, so we have to watch so that we don't give anything pulmonary toxic during the uh, transplant. A lot of our patients have refractory thrombocytopenia and after cyclophosphamide develop clots in the bladder and hemorrhagic cystitis is a big problem. Mucous membrane bleeding is a big problem. So sometimes we've had to resort to multiple platelet transfusion and even recombinant factor seven to help support. One of the biggest uh, problems with Fanconi is they're very, very sensitive to calcium uh, neuron inhibitors and, uh, um, uh, and uh, also uh, 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 um, uh, steroids. So as soon as you give calcium neuron inhibitors and steroids, they develop press. So uh, we've seen, especially in our haplo patients, we've had a huge increase in press. So we have to watch for hypertension and treat it actively. Opportunistic infections are a big problem in aplastic anemia, and especially these inherited marrow failure syndrome children seem to ha somehow have a higher incidence of Burkhold area, Aspergillus, and CMV reactivation. And the outcomes are so much poorer when they have prior opportunistic infections. So we have to get them to transplant before they have these infections. Nutrition is very important. So we aggressively feed them because they lose weight. Already they're small made. So especially if they get GVHD, they can uh, uh, lose weight very rapidly. Engraftment syndrome is one peculiar thing we see with the aplastic and uh, Fanconi transplant. They have very brisk engraftment. They have swinging fever, ferritin uh, goes high and cytokine release. And this will need again steroids uh, treatment for supportive care at that time. Again, we watch for the blood pressure at that time. So this is about immediate supportive care. And then what we need for the immediate follow-up, we'll present two cases from Ramya. So um, uh, again, now this boy, like I said, more regimen-related toxicity, more GVHD, more follow-up. So for a 14-year-old boy, Fanconi anemia matched unaffected sibling donor transplant. Multiply transfused again, several, several transfusions, almost 40 or 50, alloimmunization, platelet refractoriness. Uh, uh, he uh, received the standard conditioning of fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and ATG, PBSE as 10 cell source, and CD34 of five times. Everything was done sort of fitting into the correct uh, algorithm. He had a lot of febrile neutropenia, and he had a sudden GI bleed uh, when he was neutropenic, I think around day plus eight or nine. He required a lot of single donor platelets, of course, and uh, Novo 7 infusion and Novo 7 was given to him several times, cryopresipitate. Uh, his bill, of course, shot up the roof thanks to all of this, but he survived. He got out of this. He got engrafted. I mean, he engrafted 100% chimerism. He did have some amount of acute grade 1 to 2 skin GVHD, acute, uh, acute grade 3 gut GVHD, but these were all responsive to steroids, and he improved by day plus 75. But subsequently, he started developing slowly and gradually and a lot more of chronic GVHD. And now he's almost three to three and a half years post-transplant. He still has some chronic mouth, eye, skin GVHD. It keeps improving. In between, there's a flare-up, but it improves again. And he's received several uh, courses of low-dose steroids, ruxolitinib, mycophenolate, mofetil, and now he's also on ibrutinib. The other case is a 12-year-old boy, again, uh, Fanconi anemia, multiply transfused. Uh, so this just shows the morbidity that may be associated with these uh, multiply transfused patients uh, because he came with a high ferritin as well. Again, matched unaffected sibling donor transplant. He engrafted. He's doing well. He's almost, I think, now two years post-transplant. Uh, uh, he did have some acute grade 1 to 2 skin GVHD. Therefore, steroids were stuck started. After starting steroids with all of this background comorbidity, he had hyperglycemia, required insulin. He had hypertension with press, as ma'am said, again, required antihypertensives. 
He is well otherwise now, two years post transplant. He has 100% donor chimerism. GVHT has settled completely. He's actually off steroids and immunosuppression for almost six months now. However, the hyperglycemia is still persistent. He's still requiring some insulin. And because of the elevated ferritin, he's on phlebotomy routinely. We hope that once the ferritin normalizes, all of this other issue may settle. So thanks, Ramya. So graft versus host disease is a big problem in these inherited marrow failure syndrome because uh, uh, we, uh, uh, that, as I said, forms the bed for their future uh, malignancies. And it causes significant morbidity, mortality. They are sensitive to the medications. So uh, it's best to use early targeted therapy if they get GBHD. And we found in our own experience, even for the sibling allograft, if we use 25 mg per kg, reduced dose PTCY rather than methotrexate, mucositis and GBHD rates are lower. So uh, 25 per kg, two days of PTCY with the N-acetylcysteine infusion. And if they develop GBHD, uh, uh, um, add targeted therapy like uh, uh, RUX early rather than give them steroids, which will add to the morbidity early. Graph rejection breaks our heart. So you can see, this is the uh, story that you know is going to happen, that round about the time of engraftment, they have high swinging fever, ferritin goes up, there's no focus, and then suddenly uh, there is no graft. So you're set with pancytopenia. And it, it's very heartbreaking because there's no graft and you know that you're going to lose the child. It's related to how much uh, uh, treatment they've had before. But if we use radiotherapy, the two gray, if we've done uh, serotherapy and we've given a good dose of uh, CD34, graft rejection is lower. So that's from published papers, but still it can happen. And we have to tell patients that graft rejection is uh, one of the causes of morbidity and mortality. In inherited marrow failure syndrome, you want to prevent clonal evolution. So it's important to get complete chimerism. It's different to the primary immune deficiency children where you can get by with even 15, 20% donor and they're okay infection free because a lot of them have clonal evolution. So chimerism is something we follow up long-term even uh, once a year. CMV reactivation, uh, the, these children are very prone to, so we have to watch. And uh, uh, as Ramya said, that they have multiple endocrine issues, especially hypothyroidism. So we have to watch, and this has to be counseled to say long-term they will be on thyroid supplements. They are sensitive to uh, steroids, so they're prone to uh, avascular necrosis because already they have bone defects. So we replace calcium, vitamin D, and actively give them bisphosphonates. So this is about the immediate follow-up. What about late side effects? So now we're going to talk about the most important part of doing a transplant for an inherited marrow failure syndrome child. Thank you, ma'am. And I think uh, this is the last part of our thing because I think we need to probably finish in another five minutes to give time for discussion. So, so uh, again, these are two cases like Dr. Satya act sir actually told in the beginning itself that a lot of them have cancers and very true. Uh, uh, so this is a child who was diagnosed with Fanconi at four years of age in 2011. He underwent transplant way back in 2013 at the age of six, matched sibling donor. Three years post-transplant, he came with history of weight loss. He came with history of fever. Pet, sheet, pet CT showed multiply enlarged uh, uh, lymph nodes all over the body, huge spleen and liver. Bone marrow and aspiration biopsy confirmed diagnosis of post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, which is like a Hodgkin's-like disease. EBV was positive, all the blood EBV PCR was negative. We did counsel them for palliation, but we did also proceed with chemotherapy. He received four cycles of rituximab. He also received six cycles of gemcite with lenalidomide at 50% dose. He also subsequently received this combination chemotherapy of, with chlorambucil, windblaster, and 50% dose. And he did tolerate these well, to be honest, but the disease did not respond. He became refractory and succumbed to the illness. The other case is again quite heartbreaking. Two and a half years of age, this child was diagnosed to have Fanconi anemia and he was uh, transplanted many, many years ago in 2009 and 2010 at the age of seven years. He was very fine for about 10 to 12 years post-transplant. 
after that subsequently he developed painful lesion and painful ulcers over the tongue uh, which were of six weeks duration biopsy and mri biopsy was done which was confirming a carcinoma of the tongue mri showed multiple nodal uh, mets and uh, next slide please so uh, again yeah so they were counseled for um, treatment versus palliation and the outcome being poor and they chose palliation and he died within four months of this diagnosis so uh, this is the part that all other patients we transplant the uh, overall survival and even free survival will match but in this inherited marrow failure syndrome you can see there's a big difference between uh, os and efs there are events that happen and it keeps increasing the number of events keep increasing every year so uh, what we've learned importantly is a lot of their head and neck cancers are related to human papilloma virus so in their revaccination program it's important to include hpv vaccination and we have to counsel them to say that they're going to be very small made by doing their transplant suddenly the child is not going to become amita bachan so but growth hormone has a a, a place here it can give them a few centimeters Uh, which makes a difference to the child and we have to address their skeletal defects maybe their thumb anomalies will need plastic surgery this is one child who i transplanted which i thought was aplastic anemia but later on in those days we didn't have the gene mutation and uh, after transplant he started developing all of these changes in the nail which i thought was gvhd the mouth and the nail but he actually turned out to have dkc and it wasn't graf versus host disease so they can really trick you and he eventually got a a throat malignancy and is on radiotherapy and uh, treatment for the same now uh, uh, in the north so uh, birth defects have to be addressed organ dysfunction so this was an amazing time where the child that i showed you had the cord transplant he came back uh, in the 20th anniversary of the cord congress to give uh, a certificate of honor to uh, uh, dr gluckman who did the transplant so uh, very few uh, uh, have his luck but a lot of them have hearing issues growth puberty issues endocrine issues renal dysfunction a lot of psychosocial issues as they grow older uh, and we in our own cohort are seeing that the uh, young adults actually are not so optimal uh, and they need uh, psychosocial support and for the dkc in particular lungs we need active cancer screening in all groups of inherited marrow marrow failure because head and neck malignancies are a big problem this is again the same boy who had the cord transplant with his family fertility is affected so you tell them to finish their uh, uh, um, uh, with their uh, uh, um, uh, family early because there is primary ovarian failure in the late 20s so if they do want to have a baby earlier the better not to postpone so i'll end with the take home messages to say uh, Uh, when you're planning a transplant for patient related we have to have ngs it's the key to planning marrow uh, failure syndrome transplant haplo transplants have promising results we have to use reduced intensity conditioning and zero therapy in most of our patients cord has a source of uh, as a source has higher rejection so the numbers are reducing but tcr alpha beta is promising because it reduces the incidence of graf versus host disease however expensive we have to try and prevent mucositis and gvhd because it forms the bed for late cancers and cancer screening in these patients is lifelong um i'd like to end by uh, placing my sincere thanks to dr sheila mohan who said help set up the fanconi registry dr parinda mehta who's always helped in all of these marrow failure syndrome transplant dr babu rao who's doing pioneering work on finding the genes that cause these mutations in our own country and dr biju george who's my helpline person when we are doing these transplants ramya and venkatesh of course who are our star physicians and all of the nurses at our hospital and not but last the least the parents and families because over time we get attached to them associated with them and go through the pain and suffering they go through hopefully we will have better answers for these families in the future and thank you so much sir dr agarwal for this opportunity thank you so much dr revathi and dr ramya for that wonderful presentation enjoyed listening to you and learned a lot we'll give you some breathing time 
uh, till we sort out this uh, quiz for the day and then we'll take up the question and answer session. So today's quiz uh, was uh, a rare hematological disorder of which about 1500 cases have been published worldwide. You were given eight clues, a clinical picture and seven radiological plates. The diagnosis was Ardhine Chester disease. Uh, as was mentioned, it was described as early as 1930. Median age of presentation is 50. Males predominate. It's a multi-system disease affecting almost all organs, but the brunt falls on long bones, heart, brain, lungs, retroperitoneum, and skin. There are inflammatory findings, including on the histology, and this is reflected by raised CRP in a large number of patients. When you do histology, there is a fibroinflammatory infiltrate, and uh, the molecular event which was found was in 2012, so the BRAF V600E mutation present in 65% of patients of uh, this disorder, the ECD. Uh, this disease, after the mutations have been declared as a histiocytic neoplasm, earlier it was not very clear whether it is a neoplastic disease or not. What you saw over here in the upper eyelid, these spots over there and small spots at the bottom, these are xanthalasmas and they are present in every fourth patient. 25% of them. There can be other kind of dermatological manifestations, and this is one of the nodule which is ulcerated. Bones are extremely commonly involved, and you have to look at the long bones, and especially around the knee. What you see over here is the lower part of the femur and the upper part of the tibia, and there is appearance of the symmetrical, you can see on both the sides, metaphyseal, sclerosis around the knee joint. So that's the area you have to look for. The best way to look for that <coughs> is to either do a nuclear scan or a PET scan. What you see on the nuclear scan over here is uh, metaphyseal sclerosis. I understand that you were not seeing my slides. I'm sorry for that. Can you see the slide now? Yes, sir. I'm so sorry for that. So a little bit of repetition for you. This quiz was uh, the rare hematological disorder of which 1500 cases have been published. You were given certain clues and the diagnosis was Ardham Chesler disease. All this has been shown to you and this disease is now considered as a neoplastic disorder. These are the xanthalasmas which were shown to you and they occur in about 25% of patients. They can be skin nodules. And this is the classical symmetrical metaphyseal sclerosis seen around the knee joints. And this is where we were when I realized that you're not seeing the slides. So a nuclear bone scan can show you this symmetrical increased uptake. One of the very uh, sensitive area to be picked up by X-ray is the ankle joint. And you'll see osteosclerosis of the talus bone and a little bit in the tibia, but the talus bone is something which is very commonly involved. So overall, long bone osteosclerosis is seen in 80% of uh, people. They may have mild leg pain or they may not have any symptoms and it's best visualized by the PET scan and the nuclear bone scan. This was the X-ray chest shown to you. What you are seeing is a reticular interstitial pattern and there's a preservation of the lung volume. The CT chest shows you cystic changes in the mid and the lower zone together with interstitial thickening. There can be few nodules 
and the lung volume is once again preserved. Sometimes there could be a mass lesion in the lung. So overall, these are the three chest findings that are shown to you. Lung by CT scan is involved in 40% of patients. Both parenchyma and pleura may be involved. There are predominant centrilobular nodular obesities, interlobular septal thickening, fissural thickening in lung bases, and visceral pleural thickening. These are results of combination of inflammatory opacity and fibrosis, the sparing of the alveolar septum. This is the abdomen, and these are the kidneys, and the arrow is pointing out the area around the kidney. And this has got sort of hairy appearance. So the, there is a perirenal fat infiltration. And that's why it's called hairy kidney, seen in 60% of patients on a scan. And retroperitoneal fibrosis is seen in 30%. In fact, one of the common answers which I got from many of you was IgG4 related disease, probably because of this retroperitoneal fibrosis. And that's the MRI of the brain. And as you see over here, that's the cerebellum, which is the commonest site of involvement leading to mass effect. So cerebellar syndrome is present in 40% of patients. There is enhancing mass lesion. There can be thickened dural masses and there can be deposition in the retroorbital soft tissue leading to bilateral exophthalmos. Uh, one thing that I had not mentioned was the cardiac involvement. Cardiac involvement is common. What you see over here is aorta, and there is a sheathing of aorta. And this kind of coating of aorta is present in 50% of patients. Right atrium, there can be pseudo tumor. And there is pericardium uh, sort of involvement, which can encase the heart, leading to restrictive uh, pericarditis. And there can be involvement of the coronaries leading to myocardial infarction. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, the molecular events, the commonest is the BRAF mutation, which occurs in over almost 60% of patients. BRAF mutation occurs in number of hematological diseases. Overall, 7% of hematological malignancy can have BRAF mutation. But there is a number of other mutations which also occur. And uh, those uh, mutations, the pathway, signal pathway has been all described over here. There may be JAK-STAT pathway involvement and other pathways. Uh, overall, this is a hematological malignancy. The starting point is the hematopoietic stem cell. TAT2 mutation is an early mutation. After that, there could be either BRAC mutation or JAK pathway abnormalities. And these can lead to associated myeloproliferative myelodysplastic syndrome. So in uh, ECD, you should look out for these are patients may have presenting feature of MPD, MPN, and you may find that there is uh, ECD. Uh, there can be circulating myeloid cells, which have got the similar mutations. And uh, finally, you can look at the BRAF mutation in the, histio in the mutated histiocytes. So any organ biopsy that you've done, the histiocyte can be looked for this mutation either by immunohistochemistry or by gene sequencing of PCM. This young Indian uh, from Birmingham, University of Alabama, has done a lot of work over the last 10 years for this rare disease. He's Gaurav Goyal, he's Professor, Department of Hematology Oncology at O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center, University of Alabama, Birmingham. And he is also the first author of the guidelines uh, which have been laid down and published in blood by the group. So this is uh, outcome of uh, research by a large number of fraternity hematologists is only one of them, as you saw in the clinical picture. So the final diagnosis was RDM Chester disease. And let's now look at the correct answers. We had nine correct answers. Dr. Priyanka Dhinde, Dr. Sumit Mir, Colonel Dr. Rajan Kapoor, Dr. Hujitha Reddy, Dr. Kanwaljit Kaur, Dr. Giri Punja, Dr. Jyoti Bajaj, and Dr. David V. from Australia. But uh, although all of you were correct, 
and you have few of those large number of those who attempted and various answers came through the winner the fastest finger fast is dr ramesh b mm -hmm. congratulations dr ramesh uh if my records are right you are a resident doing dnb in department of hematology at sir gangaram hospital new delhi it's possible that you have completed your dnb and you may be a faculty so pardon me for our records but this is what we have from last year so congratulations to you send us your details and we will send you your gift thank you so much we now move on to the question and answer session uh, we have question answers uh, in the question and answer box from the audience and we have got faculty here to discuss uh, with the speakers so we'll start with dr pranta chakravarti yeah i think a great philosophical journey in a not so ideal world thank you devathi and ramya uh, i take your first take home message that you know next generation sequencing is so important for planning your transplant now if we think of the pediatrician who is seeing the child for the first time and you know so many times it came through that the earlier you do things it has a better outcome so instead of you know going in for stress cytogenetics complementation and other things would you feel that if it is accessible we would use the ngs initially and then plan with the family and then refer the patient to the transplant center that is my question to you i think this is the most uh, practical question that most people will ask because stress cytogenetics carries its own price and then after that okay stress cytogenetics has come positive so should i do the gene mutation it's the same because even if you are doing for primary immune deficiency do we need to have the flow cytometry and immunoglobulins and then we do the gene mutation or for thalassemia do we do hb electrophoresis and then uh, uh, do the gene mutation but uh, i would say in this group of children if we are planning um uh, uh, uh if we suspect that it could be an inherited marrow failure syndrome it isn't really wrong in this day and age to go straight for an ngs rather than say we'll do stress cytogenetics come back 3 weeks later with those results and then we'll say now you need gene sequencing come back another 3 weeks later uh, uh here in this particular group we are justified in going straight for an ngs especially because the packages are now uh, uh, more easily accessible and available i'm happy to get feedback from uh, any of the other shweta or sunil uh, if you want to chip in um, uh, please feel free to yeah i agree with you ma'am i think uh, you know if the uh, if the leads what you mentioned uh, you know in your presentation when we are discussing the patient selection if there are leads uh, towards more of inherited bone marrow failure syndrome than otherwise than idiopathic one it it is worthwhile uh, to to you know do it parallelly uh, because at times the essence here and as you, you you know showed that the earlier we intervene with a more definite treatment the better it is and it's going to also help with even if you are not transplanting the kid of idiopathic aplastic anemia and using uh, you know immunosuppressive therapies there also is going to help so i think it makes uh, you know a lot of sense of course uh, resources are always a constraint but it makes a lot of sense to do it parallelly rather than doing it tandem and also yeah. i think uh, ngs the uh, ease of sending a sample compared to stress cytogenetics where you have to send supposing you're outsourcing and you're sending to mumbai then you'll have to find the courier and you have to have a parallel uh, uh, control sample uh, as well so uh, here this is just an edta sample which we can send so the ease of sending a sample for ngs is also make it makes it a little bit more attractive yeah i also agree like in our daily practice also like with the ease of availability of this ngs uh, now uh, it is becoming an important investigation in managing these patients and even if the patient is like diagnosed as a idiopathic aplastic anemia in that, those patients also we have done ngs and we have found surprises in these patients So I think NGS is an important part of a workup of these patients. Completely. We will take up one question from the audience. Uh, are there any Fenton's anemia patient 
whom you will not transplant because of associated heart or other anomalies? So uh, this um, eligibility for transplant question used to be an issue, but nowadays I think most of these kids, uh, we can make them eligible. So there is no contraindications because most of us work in units where there, there is pediatric cardiologist, ICU, nephrologist, all available. But uh, supposing they already have renal dysfunction, then uh, probably uh, these are not patients I would use calcineurin inhibitors. So we just have to change our protocol in such a way that we don't worsen that particular organ which is already showing dysfunction. So uh, uh, the answer is th there's no one who's ineligible for transplant. Yeah. Thank you. Even the ones who've had an intracerebral bleed, we support and then after they get better, we can take up or the ones with fungal infection. So there isn't anyone. There's also, sir, an interesting question from Dr. Naresh about ADA2, whether thalidomide will work and whether you will do x-rays for everyone. So the selected, uh, uh, since we're talking about patient selection, I would say that uh, we try to reduce x-rays and CT scans and uh, even uh, uh, unnecessary imaging in these patients. Uh, because, uh, but we need, if you need an ultrasound and echo, these are things that will help us. So if there is a digital uh, deformity, there isn't any need to x-ray to show that the radius is absent because uh, these are all part of the uh, uh, condition anyway. But uh, ADA2 deficiency uh, is a completely different spectrum. So none of us have great experience. If they come with auto-inflammatory presentation vasculitis, we need to give them steroids. Other drugs like thalidomide, how effective they are, I don't know, but I would counsel them for early transplant rather than keep them on prolonged steroids. Thank you, Dr. Rajan Kapoor. Excellent talk, and a great learning on this Sunday morning. And Ramya, as they say, you have hit the ball out of the park. Very well done. So my question specifically is, uh, Say sanctinase anemia and two agents, cyclophosphamide and ATP. So cyclophosphamide, if we use in conditioning, what is the dose which we use? And you mentioned in March sibling and we are using PTCY as a GVHD prophylaxis, the dose. And in which cases will you use ATG? I mean, one more to add, is there any rationale of using ATG along with PTCY? So, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, these are thoughts that uh, have gone also through our mind. So if the Fanconi patient has come to us with uh, less than 15 transfusions, then we'll only do flu uh, uh And if they are mad sibling donor, they won't get the two gray TBI. If they are half low, they will get the two gray TBI. All of them get PTCY at 25 per kg on day three and day four. Um, along with the N-acetylcysteine and Mesna infusions. Um, uh, ATG will be added only for those who are heavily transfused or they've already come with platelet refractoriness and you know that they're going to, uh, uh, they're at a higher risk of rejecting their graft. So I'm sorry if I may add to the discussion that you just said that the, because the side dose as compared to the non-IBMFS aplastics is much, much low here, even for the matched ATG has a role uh, in Fanconi. So the flu side ATG. Thank you. One question from the audience again. Which factors drive the inferior outcome for haplotransplant as compared to MFD transplant in IBMF, which are not seen in leukemic haplotransplants where the outcomes are comparable? So I think these were earlier data to say alternate donor transplants are in, in uh, outcomes are inferior to match sibling because uh, when they don't have a match sibling donor, they wait for a long time for an unrelated donor search. So they get more hemorrhagic, they need more transfusion, get exposed to opportunistic infections. So uh, I also showed you data from Dr. Parinda Mehta's group where even in the alternate donor, they have cracked it all and said that uh, you, you use targeted uh, conditioning, you use uh, uh, TCR alpha beta depleted peripheral stem cells and uh, their results are over 90% uh, 90 survival in this group. So 
This was all earlier data. In our country, however, we are growing because, uh, and we are learning. So it's a learning curve. Those who have a math sibling, they proceed to transplant earlier compared to uh, those who have, uh, 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 who, who need an alternate donor because it's a more expensive procedure. The outcomes are lower because there are delays in getting to transplant, that, that's all. So if we can fast track them, I'm sure they will also do as well as the sibling allografts. Thank you, Sunil Bhatt. Um, thank you, sir. It was a really uh, lovely uh, to hear Dr. Um, Revati to, uh, you know, very short span of time to cover um, probably the every aspect of uh, inner bone marrow uh, transplant um, uh, syndrome transplants. I have got two comments basically to make. One was, I think, which Dr. Rajan asked a question of uh, post transfer cyclophosphamide. You know, I feel that you know, um, in in Fantinimas and the syndromes uh, which are similar. Um, our conditioning uh, is predominantly going to be reduced toxicity with, with, a, with a focus on good immunosuppression rather than myeloblation. And uh, the concerns are both uh, primary as well as secondary rejection, which are huge concerns. Even after the engraft, they, they reject many months after transplant. So my practice and as well as you know what I kind of understand from all of it is that ATG is an is a important aspect of conditioning, even those who have not been heavily transfused. Uh, because it gives us an element of immunosuppression, which otherwise is deficient uh, with the traditional flu site conditioning. So we do use ATG condition for all the transplants, including haplotransplants. Um, the second question was about the post-transfer cyclophosphamide. Um, you know, um, yes, I think it's a poor man's, uh, you know, uh, strategy for haplotransplantation in these conditions, because as ma'am said, uh, no, deeply transplant is quite expensive, but given a choice, in fentanyl especially, we should try to, uh, you know, go in, in, in the direction of T-cell depletion, T-cell alpha beta depletion rather than post-transfer cyclophosphamide because, uh, you know, the concerns of um, mucositis, uh, poor graft function and uh, late uh, engraftment is a concern with post-transfer cyclophosphamide. And that's how the results are in the range of 6 to 70% all across, which can be improved further with a T-cell depleted graft. So, so that was a, a comment on uh, Dr. Rajan's question. Uh, the second, uh, you know, aspect on why the tra transplant outcomes are inferior in haplo setting as compared to the match sibling setting, of course they are, um, you know, a uh, little inferior. Although we have come a long way, and and the and and the reasons being the same, we still have a higher risk, risk of rejection with haplo transplantation. We do have significant graft versus host disease even with PTCY strategy, because the lower dose probably you know, uh, isn't enough, but we can't give them higher than that, uh, keeping in, in, in mind their, you know, primary disease. So definitely the graph is are higher as well as the, the rejections are higher. So hence the outcomes still probably are not comparable, which probably can be improved. Another strategy is being the T-cell T -cell depletion. Um, I think uh, one of the questions, ma'am, which uh, I, I, you know, comes again and again, students are listening to this and I want to ask you about the donor selection from the families. So uh, siblings, uh, you had already discussed in great detail, uh, but you know it comes also. You know most of the people, these are autosomal recessive conditions, and most of the parents are parents are carriers. So is there is there anything uh, on that note you want to say? Of course, we can use the carriers, but there are some some conditions which you try to avoid carrier as a donor, and because that's something which uh, you know uh, uh, comes up uh, comes across. Second is how do we deal with a mixed chimerism because rejections for second rejections are a concern, and I. I have seen a quite a fix, few second rejections, even after good complete chimerism earlier on. So, how do you, um, uh, you know, address these uh, in your in your practice? Thank you. So, thanks, Sunil, for the comments. So, I will clarify as Ramya said, the dose of flu side that we use in mixed uh, max sibling donor transplant in Fanconi, the cyclophosphamide dose is very low. We will only do ten per kg for four days as opposed to 50 per kg that we do in uh, um, uh, acquired aplastic anemia. So all max sibling donors will get ATG uh, and the P, uh, PTCY at 25 per kg. But what I meant about using uh, ATG selectively is in the alternate donor transplant uh, uh, because uh, uh, there, there is a role for not using if they come to you fresh but that is going to be a minuscule amount of patients. And there also there's more and more wisdom coming out that ATG will reduce GBHD. So we've started using in all of our transplant uh, serotherapy now. 
So the second thing is about parents. Meform is autosomal dominant. So there we will look at the parents and whoever is a carrier. Sometimes one of them, uh, one of our parents, he just had uh, uh, um, just the uh, ulnar radio ulnar synostosis, but normal counts looking completely fine. So we wouldn't use him as the donor. So an X-linked recessive is uh, DKC. So you wouldn't like to use the mother, but most of our other autosomal recessive, we use a parent. And in our uh, unit, it's preference to use the father rather than the mother to avoid multiparous women as a donor. We've not chosen siblings as much in, in our uh, uh, marrow failure syndrome uh, program for uh, alternate donor. If it's a fully matched sibling, yes, but all the alternate, uh, uh, don that is the haplo uh, transplants have been majority from the parents unless they are very elderly or they're not uh, able to donate. Thank you. One question from the audience. What is the usual dose of CD34 used in these transplants? Is there any upper cutoff? Do you decide the dose by CD3 count in the graft? You want to answer this, Ramya? Sure, sure ma'am. So uh, this is uh, again data which we have published as an abstract. This is in the we we looked at eighty nine haplo uh, un unmanipulated haplos with uh, PT size, and we with the statistics guy we sat and did some thing he did whatever he did, but with that he we came to a, a conclusion that a CD thirty four of about five times is important, but more so a CD3 of about 1.5 times. This is from our data. I mean, I'm just telling you what we follow. And we found that when CD3 was more than 1.5 times, the risk of graft rejection was much less as compared to when CD3 was less than 1.5 times. So we tailor the, especially when it comes to haplopt psi, we tailor the dose of stem cells based on the CD3 more than just the CD34, but a CD34 of minimum five times would be what is recommended, but a CD3 of at least 1.5 times, 1.5 to 10 to the power 8 of the uh, kg per recipient body weight. This is, of course, our experience and, you know, just what we have done. Thank you, Dr. Shweta Bansal, your question. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful uh, Sunday morning uh, for the excellent lecture. And I would say very, very excellent Jugal Bandi between both of you, Dr. Ramya and Dr. Devati. And uh, Dr. Ramya highlighted many of the issues very and very well explained by Dr. Devati. So as explained or uh, as highlighted in your uh, some of the cases that uh, the blood transfusions uh, is an issue with these patients and iron overload is an issue with these patients while doing the transplant. And we have also faced a lot of problems because of the iron overload, especially in Pankanese and other patients with IBFMS. So uh, Dr. Revithi, how do you manage iron overload in these patients? Do you do anything pre-transplant or uh, do any chelation post-transplant? How you go about that? Uh, one of our patients was one of those who had had transfusions for several years before we, he got to us. Uh, in most of these patients, by the time they come to us, there isn't any time for chelation pre-BMT. So you, we just have to uh, proceed with the transplant and the liver is chock-a-block with iron, heart is chock-a-block with iron. So these are the patients for whom we will start the NSHI cysteine along with their conditioning itself to prevent venoocclusive disease and heart problems. So they will have until day 42. That is the only drug we have to, uh, 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 to reduce the, uh, uh, the oxidative damage to more oxidative damage to uh, the liver or the heart and uh, uh, avoid uh, hepatotoxic, um, cardiotoxic drugs. Um, so these are the things that we can do. So for example, if they're haplo uh, transplants and they have the allo effect fever, so they'll be having disproportionate tachycardia and their heart is not something that can cope with so much disproportionate tachycardia. Early on itself, we will start low dose adrenaline. So these are things that we have to do, but after finishing transplant, once they are uh, nine months post transplant, we actively do phlebotomy just like the thalassemia group. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Uh, so regarding the, so we do see a lot of poor graph functioning because of this iron overload and we need to do chitation. Do you do DLI for these patients? Yeah, actually I didn't answer Sunil's question also. In the TALS, somehow you feel confident about doing DLI because if they get GVHD also, you know you can 
pick them up. But uh, in uh, Fanconi and in inherited marrow failure syndromes, it is uh, scary to do DLI. And also there's always a worry should I uh, withdraw immunosuppression? Should I step up immunosuppression? What should we do here? So uh, these are just uh, difficult, uh, um, uh, 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 difficult scenarios. So um, for the moment in the inherited marrow failure syndromes who are heavily transfused uh, group, if there is mixed thymidism initially, our uh, uh, approach has to be, uh, has been to step up immunosuppression. So add uh, MMF and then follow up the graph a uh, little bit more uh, conservative about adding DLI because if it ends up sometimes they've gone into full marrow aplasia or bad uh, GVHD when we've given DLI sometimes it's better for them to totally reject their graft and then redo it rather than run the risk of uh, uh, giving GVHD to them so thank you one more question from the audience yeah. Can horse ATG replace rabbit ATG in conditioning with a PTCY backbone in marrow failure transplants? So we've used uh, horse ATG day minus three, minus two, minus one at 15 per kg in the max sibling setting in all of these patients. But if they're alternate donor transplants, then they get rabbit ATG way on at the beginning from day minus nine, minus eight, and minus seven. If any of the others want to chip in and say if their experience is different, I'm happy to listen to that. Just a, just a comment, sir, on the DLI, uh, which, you know, it's an important aspect because mixed chimerism rejections are important, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 the, in these kind of transplant practices. So what we, it's a very, very small series, though, what we do uh, with our TCR alpha beta depleted haplos, uh, we we keep uh, uh, a fraction of CD45 RA deplete haplos, which have got the memory cells. And we introduce the DLIs quite early on, on day plus 30. And plan is to do three to four DLIs, uh, irrespective of their chimerism status, because it helps in both in chimerism as well as in the immune recovery post-transplant. And with that, we, you know, it, as it's a very small series of case patients for four or five uh, patients, which I've used that we, do, you know, see, um, you know, we haven't seen any rejections. Um, uh, thus far. So that may be one of the strategies which we can also employ uh, in, uh, but I agree with ma'am to give DLIs in a pure haplo setting with, with a T cell repeat graft is, is, is tricky and uh, can have, you know, con you know uh, uh, quite significant complications. I mean, the DLI that you're doing in your group is mainly for immune reconstitution because these are memory cells that you want to introduce and that's part of the protocol. But if they have mixed chimerism and you have to give whole blood DLI or aferist DLI in, in this group, it is, uh, uh, I would be hesitant. Thank you. We have another eight minutes to go and we've got three faculty here. Dr. Ruchira Misra, your question. Um, Ma'am, thank you for that excellent presentation. We always kind of wait to hear your presentations and I especially love that theme background that you give to each of your presentation just tells me about how much thought has actually gone in into thinking about what to present and how to present it. Uh, fantastic um, thought on that. My question to you uh, covered two aspects. One of Shota's questions was about poor graft function. And you also know that inherited bone marrow failure syndromes have a poor soil basically um, for the cells to grow in as well. So how do you handle poor graft function when you know that the chimerism is 99% or a full chimerism in those cases? What would you do there? So thank you, Richuda. If you know us well, you know that whenever we have to have a meeting, first thing Ramya and I decide is uh, what theme. So we have to choose the theme and what sari. So these two, were, and then only the content comes. So <laughs> so, so I noticed the so black it, also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we also enjoy. So now your question, poor graph function is a problem. So what are the things we can do? With, there's more and more data saying l thrombo pack can be used to improve graph, graph function and it is safe. We also use in the, these patients bisphosphonates because as you said, the marrow stroma are, uh, is not uh, optimal. So whenever the counts are low, we give Famidronate and uh, uh, introduce uh, um, vitamin D and bisphosphonates to see if this can improve the graph function. But other than that, there is little else we can do, but always look for viruses. If there's poor graph function, there's a virus lurking behind. 
Thank you. One question from the audience. How do you approach a newly diagnosed pancreas at the age of 20 years who is now diagnosed to MDS EB2 and squamous cell carcinoma of the aero digestive tract simultaneously? Yeah, Deepak, I saw that question and I convulsed with horror. I think yeah. I'm glad that patient is with you and not me. Now, this is a very complex case. So, uh, uh, the honest truth, if you want, this is a patient that we would only palliate because it's all very complicated. The first dose of radiotherapy will make them pancytopenic. But if they are truly interested, then uh, uh, we'll have to do uh, cetuximab is more and more uh, used in head and neck malignancies in this uh, group. So you start with the cet cetuximab and uh, 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 fast track their uh, uh, haplotransplant, which would be a TCR alpha beta one with a reduced intensity conditioning and then refer them to the radiotherapy unit so that their marrow will be normal by the time they start radiation. Thank you, Dr. Pranothi Kini. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for the webinar and ma'am, excellent presentation. I have two questions. One, uh, which would be our preferred graft source, marrow versus PBSC? And my second question, in a fancony with monosomy 7, what is the preferred conditioning that you would use? Thank you. So uh, I think uh, all of us say if it is uh, uh, benign conditions, if it's aplastic anemia, marrow is the preferred choice uh, of uh, uh, um, stem cell source. But uh, um, we, we use marrow if it is a sibling graft, fully matched sibling, but in the uh, T-replete uh, um, uh, haplo setting, we've always used uh, only uh, PBSE because we are looking at the CD3 numbers. So this way, if you're able to get CD34 and CD3 numbers and tailor the graft, you should be okay to use PBSE. Um, second uh, question is, uh, 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 sorry, the first one was about which is the correct source. And then with the, uh, uh, if they are going, having a clone and they're evolving to MDS, AML, would the transplant be different? Um, absolutely not. But only thing is, in this case, we pro proceed with the transplant, but post BMT, when we, uh, in other groups, when we say that they shouldn't get GVHD, you let these children have a little bit of GVHD by withdrawing their immunosuppression early, and you hope that the GVHD will give the GVL effect. And uh, oh, there is a strategy yeah. to add uh, azacytidine also from day plus 45. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thanks, Dr. Amit. Thank you, ma'am, for the excellent presentation. So, my questions for you are, ma'am, uh, your choice of CNIs, ma'am, then uh, levels you are targeting during peri engraftment and post engraftment phase, and ma'am, your strategies for uh, tapering and stopping uh, immunosuppressants in aplastic anemia or inherited marrow failure. So thank you, Amit. I think this uh, the GVHD prophylaxis is the meat of doing these transplants. Initially, in the sibling allograph, we uh, used to use methotrexate. And you can see that the mucositis, in most fanconi, they have prolonged mucositis. In other transplants, once their counts recover, mucositis gets dramatically better. But fanconi patients are still stuck on the ward. They're still on TPN. So another week to 10 days, their body takes to recover from mucositis. So uh, as I said, uh, even in the um, uh, uh, sibling graft, we've uh, moved over to uh, PTCY at 25 per kg. And uh, in all our patients, we use uh, uh, tacrolimus and we aim for trough levels of 5 to 15 um, right from the beginning. And even in the haplo setting, we start at day minus 2. And when to start reducing immunosuppression and tapering, this we have to be careful uh, not to start before the end of the first year because during that time only, they are, uh, if they start getting some mouth ulcers and chronic mouth GVHD, that would be a bet for uh, uh, cancers later. So start after a year and uh, 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 do the immunosuppression taper very gently. So it, it can take three to six months, but it has to be done over an extended period of time. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, 
Uh, that brings us to the end of this uh, webinar. I'm thankful to Dr. Satyaranjan Das for inaugurating it. Our speakers, Dr. Revati Raj and Dr. Ramya Upulari for an excellent lecture. All the discussions were present here, all the audience who put in important questions and above all, NATCO for supporting us and MICE Ideas for managing it. Good day to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.